With a $67.2 billion market size and nearly 7% annual growth, the sporting goods industry has become one of the fastest growing industries in the U.S. since 2018. You've got over uh, 240 million people who are participating in sports and activities in the United States. So it's a, it's a big market. And then you've got about 90.5 million who are in the outdoor participation, such as hiking, camping, fishing. The biggest player, Dick's Sporting Goods, controls an estimated 14.2% of the market share, the most by single company. Dick's Sporting Goods has been one of the better retailers at really continuing to evolve with the customer, with the demands of the customer. They always made sure to pick very good real estate that was in prominent locations. In 2021, Dick's Sporting Goods saw record-setting revenue of $12.3 billion as the company pivoted its distribution strategy during the pandemic. Today, the company looks to sustain that growth as leadership shifts to a new CEO, a focus on technology, and navigating tough competition in the sporting goods e-commerce space. In 1948, Dick Stack, an 18-year-old with just $300 in his pocket, opened his first business. At the time, it was just a simple bait and tackle shop that later expanded to work clothes, sportswear, equipment, camping gear, and picnic supplies. Dick's Sporting Goods' expansion was slow, taking nearly two decades for the second storefront to open. But by the 1970s and 80s, business started taking off when Ed Stack, Dick's son, joined and bought the company from his father. In the 90s, the company expanded its offering to include more sports, outdoor equipment, apparel, and footwear. By 1996, there were 50 Dick's Sporting Goods stores. As hard as it might be to believe today, Adidas wouldn't sell to us, um, uh, Puma at the time wouldn't sell to us, so you know, we almost went out of business a couple of times. In 1987, we almost went out of business with the, uh, the savings and loan crisis. Uh, the, the bank basically said, we can't lend you any money any longer. We had to find another bank. Uh, we almost went out of business again in uh, 1994 when we moved the company from Binghamton to Pittsburgh, and we grew too fast. So in 1987, we almost went out of business. That wasn't our fault. In 1994, we almost went out of business. It was completely all of our fault. With 141 stores across 25 states, Dick's went public in 2002. At the same time, competitors like Sports Authority emerged as the sporting goods segment grew in popularity as sports participation ballooned in the early 2000s. Its biggest competitor, Sports Authority, had 221 more stores than Dick's and generated more revenue. But Dick's sporting goods saw consistent revenue and net income growth as the company grew its reach with more stores. Improving operating margins was vital to the company's sustained success. Where we started in Binghamton, New York, and then we went to Syracuse, then Rochester, then Albany and Buffalo, and we stayed in these very concentric circles. So our distribution costs were probably less. Um, our marketing costs we could leverage. Uh, our management costs to get out to see the stores uh, was a, a lot easier. And those concentric circles, I think, was really a big key to our success in being able to survive when so many others in our industry weren't able to. Dick's quickly edged out Sports Authority, overtaking the once king of sporting goods retail by 2005. And just a year later, Sports Authority went private after it was acquired by private equity firm Leonard Green and Partners. Sports Authority and others that have gone out of business through the years, it, you know, maybe didn't operate as well. They didn't have the real estate in the right places. They didn't have the breadth of assortment to really cover this, the athlete that, that was shopping there. And they kind of missed the mark in multiple areas. Dix has always thought ahead. They've always worked hard to change and be different. Historically, the sporting goods segment consists of many small players, typically owner-operated stores. Those stores account for over 64% of the market share, each tailored to specific needs of their communities. In 2022, Dick's Sporting Goods accounted for 14.2% of the market share, the largest by single company. That all came from heavy investments in acquisitions, innovation, and technology. The company went on a spending spree from 2004 to 2007. It acquired Galen's Trading Company, Golf Galaxy, and Chick Sporting Goods, boosting the company's footprint from over 230 stores to nearly 500 in 2008. In the consecutive decade from 2008 to 2014, revenue jumped 65%. While Dick's Sporting Goods was expanding, its once biggest rival sports authority was on the verge of collapse. After exchanging hands three times from 1990 to 2005, sports authority struggled to find its footing. The company began selling its assets off to former competitors, primarily Dick's in 2016. 
Sports Authority's once massive footprint had allowed the brand to accumulate an enormous customer database. When Dick's purchased Sports Authority's IP in 2016, the company got access to 28.5 million Sports Authority's loyalty program members and an estimated 114 customer files, including emails, addresses, and transaction history data. I think that was a pretty shrewd move. They got data to all their customers and they were able to market to them through the Dick's uh, loyalty program. They also captured some of the private brands that, they, that were popular at Sports Authority. And I do believe that Dick's has you know, done a very good job to sort of bring that into their own portfolio and to use that to help them to grow, uh, certainly to capture some percentage of that, that consumer, but also just then to expand the market uh, from that level. A lot of people don't realize that our first e-commerce sale was in 1999, but we have always made technology investments, whether it was from the e-com standpoint. And in 2017, we made significant investments from a technology standpoint, from a system standpoint, from an e-commerce standpoint. In 2018, a vital inflection point in the company's evolution came amid an immense tragedy. After the Parkland shooting where 17 students and faculty members lost their lives, the company took a stand on guns. It had been selling guns for seemingly its entire history and capturing a sizable chunk of its annual revenue. Then CEO Ed Stack initiated an internal review of their long-standing gun sales business. In 2018, the company announced it would stop selling assault-style guns, high-capacity magazines, and firearms to anyone under the age of 21. The company announced that it would destroy any unsold inventory. The backlash wasn't inconsequential. The company estimated a $250 million loss. We found out that the kid who, sh who did the shooting in Parkland actually bought a shotgun from us, and we did everything right. We did everything right by the book. And at that point, we said, you know what, the system as it's set up today isn't working. That We knew that was going to have a real negative impact on our business, and it did, but we knew that it was the right thing to do. And as we look back on it today, if we had the chance to do it all over again, we do it exactly the same way. You look at their business numbers and it hasn't it hasn't hurt them at all. They've continued to be uh, to be successful even though they got out of that that segment of the industry. We took guns out those guns out in, in a number of stores. We did a test and took all firearms out of our store and reallocated that square footage and and products that we put in there. And we found that we did more business at better margins with the other product. And uh, that's why the street didn't have much of, uh, of, of an issue with it. In March 2020, at the height of the pandemic, Dick's Sporting Goods closed all of its stores as the company was deemed non-essential compared to other businesses. With all of its stores closed and its high-priced inventory filling shelves where no customers are walking through the doors, Dick's Sporting Goods needed to act and needed to act fast. It was a scary time for everybody from a health standpoint and from a, a business standpoint, what was going to go on. And so our technology group pulled together curbside pickup in two days. So we had originally kind of put a roadmap together, thought it could take roughly a year to get done with all the testing and everything that we wanted to do. But the necessity is the mother of invention and we didn't have any time to do that. And the technology group and Lauren pushed on this was very hard that uh, they, they pulled together the technology and we had this up and running in, in two days. Curbside pickup allowed customers to place their orders online, drive to the store, and have contactless pickup. Circumventing the need to go into stores, allowing Dick's Sporting Goods to offload its massive inventory at a time where shopping in stores wasn't safe. E-commerce was another example of a major lifeline for the company. Just a few years prior in 2017, as major rival sports authorities went bankrupt and in-store sales were slumping, the company saw a clear shift in the industry. Dick's invested heavily in e-commerce and technology and it revitalized its site. That decision proved beneficial when the pandemic broke out. In 2020, e-commerce sales reached $2.8 billion, a 100% increase from 2019. Nearly 70% of online orders were fulfilled directly by stores through curbside orders. So over the past five years, Dix has gotten much better and more efficient as an operator. They have done a very good job embracing e-commerce and all the work that you need to do to make e-commerce an omni-channel, a very fluid and efficient process for the consumer, such that you know when the inventory is in stock in a store, when it can be picked up, when it should be shipped, where it should be shipped from. All of those things have made omni-channel retail possible at Dick's Sporting Goods. And they're one of the better ones that have really embraced it and gotten to a point where the profitability of an e-commerce sale is pretty much on par with going to a store. 
the momentum continued well into 2021, as the company set new records. Revenue grew nearly 30%, net income nearly tripled, and Wall Street was ecstatic. Share prices shot up to record heights, peaking at $145.19 on October 30th, 2021. The sporting goods market hit nearly $70 billion in 2022. And while the industry has seen robust growth, competition is rising. We've clearly saw in 2022, and I think we're going to continue to see going forward, that consumers have embraced some of these new sports and some of these new hobbies. And we expect that to continue. We expect the business to normalize back to kind of that low to mid single digit industry growth rate, call it, you know, anywhere three to 5% in a given year. And we would expect the exporting goods to be able to grow at or above that pace as they continue to capture market share from smaller independent players within the sporting goods space. In 2022, Dix partnered with Nike to establish exclusive product launches and campaigns and be the first provider of new products. The relationships with our brands are really important. And we've got a, a number of uh, brands that we characterize as strategic partners. And those strategic partners, we work with them. We work with them from a marketing standpoint, supply chain standpoint, what the product looks like in the store, and the amount of space that they get in the store. But we've got a, a great um, balance between the brands and, and our own vertical brands that we have. And those vertical brands have done very well. And the primary brands such as Nike, you know, Callaway, uh, North Face, we continue to invest and grow those brands also. Competitors in the space like REI are developing larger storefronts, creating one-stop shop superstores to compete with big box stores like Walmart that offer low-cost sporting goods. Over the next few years, analysts suggest the sporting goods industry will tighten. I think the big thing that we're also trying to figure out is what's the right level of operating profit the company should run at? And, you know, by operating profit, I'm talking EBIT margin or operating profit margin. And I think investors are trying to figure out should it stay in the low double digit area? Should it go back to low, you know, high single digits, mid single digits? For years prior to the pandemic, they operated at around a five, five and a half percent operating margin. All of a sudden in 2021, they're at a 15% operating margin. So what's the right level? And I think that's where you continue to see a little bit of concern from the consumer. And I think the, the investor in sporting goods continues to, to think about What's the normalization path? Inflation's been something we've all had to deal with, whether it be supply chain costs, you know, um, you know, costs of everything have gone up. And, and we've been really, our team's done a really good job of adjusting to that. We've increased, you know, payroll costs have gone up. We've been very happy to increase our payroll costs and, and our businesses continue to be very good. In Q3 of 2022, net sales increased 7.7% from year prior. It increased over 50% from 2019, attributing its jump to the company's focus on maintaining its continued strong performance and quality of product lineups, and focus on the company's future, therefore expanding the in-house brands, developing its e-commerce network, and widening the company's margins going forward. And we know that we have to be thoughtful um, on how we grow. We have to be thoughtful to make sure that we don't let our business outrun our management team's ability to manage it, our capital structure. We've learned from those mistakes. And one thing we're really good at is we never make the same mistake twice. 